just take another two minutes and then uh, we'll start. Okay. You know, we don't want to, it's a good thing. <laughs> Everybody knows me. All right, so uh, we're gonna focus on equity options and the, the term you guys use ESOP, equity stock option plan. There are a few different things in there and I'm gonna kind of keep it simple as much as possible. And we of course have more conversations later on. Uh, but I want to start with uh, a couple of caveats. First, I'm not a lawyer, okay? So this is more practical experience of how these things work, but obviously there can be a lot of nuance to it, right? So if you have something specific, you should consult a lawyer. Second, my experience comes from the United States structure, right? And there are some differences between the way U.S. does uh, uh, equity and the understanding of it and the way India does it. I don't know the exact uh, differences, but I do know that exists. So, you know, any corporate secretary or any lawyer, a corporate lawyer could uh, help figure those pieces out uh, if you were to get into it in more detail, okay? But the framework is essentially the same, okay? So, so those are the two caveats. All right, so let's go for the first part. And some of this is going to be very elementary. It's definitely for Kaushik and, uh, and Badri, but some of it is gonna be like kind of complicated. I don't understand what the hell it is. So it'll be, I have to kind of span a little bit of, you know, uh, breadth here. So I'll try to do the best I can. Okay, so. Okay, so the first thing is you, you want to know two things. What is a stock and what is an option, okay? Uh, a stock is actually ownership in the company. You actually, if you have a stock, you own a piece of the company. And when you say stock, it's kind of a plural of a share. When you say stock, you can say I have stock in the company, or I can, I, you can say I have 10,000 shares in the company. They are equivalent, okay? So that's really important to understand that you actually own. So if you have, a company will be made up of shares, shares are a portion of the company, and you can own 10,000 shares. But if it so happens that if you own every share, then you 100% own the company, right? So that's the sort of understanding. And if you uh, are an outsider, and I like you do in your public stock market, you go in and say, I see what the uh, stock is, and today it's uh, you know 2,000 rupees, and you pay it and buy it, that's your purchase price. It's your cost, right? And five days later, you look again, it's 2,100, okay? That's the current value of the stock. You know, the purchase price never changes, but the current value will change, right? That's what we call par value, okay? So the difference, we want to know this because when you file taxes at the end of the year, the government wants to know the difference between a purchase price and your, not really current value, but really your selling price if you sold it today, because that's what they want to tax on. Okay, that's capital gains. Setting that aside, you have these things, purchase price, and then you have the current value. It, it, those are sort of very basic, like everybody should more or less know this stuff, okay? And please feel free to stop me at any point if I'm, saying a thing that is not fully clear, okay? So you should go like, I don't understand, what is par? Why do you call it par? Whatever it is, I can, I can, I can try to explain as best as I can. So that, that part is fine, and that's how most companies operate, okay? If you went to a, you know, two people starting a business together, not a startup, and they say, we're gonna go 50-50, and they go and they start growing, and they say, let's incorporate, okay? Then they will say, uh, we're gonna have a thousand shares and we're gonna split it 500, 500, right? You know, that was what would happen, you know, it becomes stock, you know, you own the piece of the company, et cetera. So there's no question of what we call option in that case, okay? Now, what is an option? An option is a promise given by the corporation to a person saying, at some future point, you can buy a share of my company at this price, okay? 
So it's just a promise. Just because I give you the promise doesn't mean you own a part of my company. Okay? That's a crucial difference. An option, the person holding the option, that promise on the other side, doesn't own a part of the company. Okay, at that point. Okay? So it's a promise. And so that's a difference, major difference, right? But options also operate as shares. Stock operates as shares. Options also are shares. You'll say, hey, you know, uh, Kaushik, I am going to give you 1,000 options, okay? That means I'm giving you essentially a promise that you can buy 1,000 shares in my company, okay? Now, that's fine. The, the, what price, right? In shares, if I told you like just over the top, I'm gonna to allow you to buy shares, whenever you buy it typically will be the current value, the par value, okay? But in the case of options, you have what's called a exercise price, where you tell the person, I'll give you $1,000, okay? I will allow you to buy it at 10 rupees, okay? So I will say, Kaushik, you can buy 1,000 shares, you can buy it one year from now. You follow? One year from now. But at that time, you can buy it at 10 rupees. Okay? So what happens is that they still have to pay for the uh, share finally. Right? And that's, that piece of it, when they buy, is called exercising the option. It converts the option into a share. Okay? But the reason why this is valuable is, one, you're not allowing them to hold your company, right? That's number one. You, they have to wait. Let's say the, uh, Kaushik is supposed to give me accounting services. By holding this, I am guaranteed to get the services, right? So I'm not prepaying the person, I'm postpaying the person, right? So I'm saying like, okay, so I can give that. And the other thing is that I told you the current value, par value goes from 2000 to 2100, but you can also go from 2000 to 1900, right? What if the company is not worth anything, right? So this, these things can happen. So what happens is that when you say you can buy it at 10 rupees, at that time, Kaushik looks at, one year later, looks at the option and says, I can buy it at 10 rupees. What is the par value of the stock? Okay. And par value of the stock is, let's say, 90 rupees. Kaushik will give the company 10 rupees per share, buy all the shares, turn around and sell it to someone else at 90 rupees, right? They immediately make the profit or they can. They can hold on to it, but suddenly, because now without almost any like overhead, they have this thing, they didn't pay a dime, they have a promise, they're waiting to see if they have gonna make money and then they exercise it, okay? That is the major thing about options. Okay, so I'll stop here and, uh, you know, if this is confusing or, or over-explained or, or anything, you guys really should ask the questions. And if you do chat or something, I'm sure Sham can uh, ask yeah. on your behalf. Uh, uh, yes, Gopi. So what I will do is like, uh, again, I mean, people can ask questions uh, along the flow, but uh, if people want to park their questions as well, please do put it on the chat window. Gopi, I do have a question at this point in time. Uh, who determines an, or, or how do you determine the exercise price of the option, right? When you are issuing or when you're giving the options to your employees, right? Is it based on the current valuation of the company or is it, is it an arbitrary number? How do you arrive at something uh, of that price? Yeah, 99% of the time, it's a current value. If you have just been funded, let's say, or you decided your valuation is X, you would have decided that my share par value is X. And when you write that option, you'll try to use the same price. Uh, because let's say somebody gave you money and they gave it to you at 10 rupees, but then you turn around and give five rupees option to somebody else, you're cheating the investor, right? They got it cheaper. So they don't like that. So it typically is at the same price, but I don't think that's necessarily illegal to go above or below. Okay, so I think that is possible. But generally, good practice is at, at, the, at the current value, valuation. In the case of private, in, in the case of public companies, it's very clear, right? When it's written, they know what the price is. But in the case of private companies, we don't know exactly. It may be the last funding round. 
it may be last funding round plus we'll do some valuation and say right now it's a little bit more it's this money so it could be a little bit different yeah the exercise price so go be quick question go ahead so when you're offering someone an exercise price do you speculate how much the company would have grown in future and give them that price or current day's price you give current day's price you don't know exactly what it's going to be uh, you hope everybody hopes as investors that that's going to be worth something in the future more but you don't know right so it'll be current current price thank yes. you later on ask me a question about underwater options okay i'll explain that too okay. all right okay so that's that's the basics right uh, so we we kind of covered a couple of them here the promise the share the exercise price then there's something called vesting uh, period and exercising the option okay so uh, so let's talk about this a little bit more okay um, the, the, there's a danger in shares okay and what is the danger especially for startups let's say and this actually is a documented case because it's it showed up in a in a movie in a documentary about a startup let's say three founders start okay and all three of you go you know what we're going to work really hard we love it etc cetera, etc cetera, and we're going to split it you know 33 33 33 we're great well, let's work on this and one person says you guys you know keep working i i just have to finish this one job okay and i'll quit in three months and but i'll also be in the evening and all of that so it goes on for a while okay and then but that person doesn't join okay and they don't join because maybe their boss said yeah, i really need you here's a raise here's some extra income etc right here's a promotion now if that person doesn't join how much is the distribution of the actual ownership of the company between the three people if that person doesn't join If they've already entered, then they then they're the, unfortunately are forced to give the thirty-three percent that they that they promised. Exactly. Yeah. Once you're given the shares, you're given the shares. It doesn't matter if they do anything whatsoever. Do you see what what happens when you bring in a VP of sales or VP of marketing or anybody else? That same problem will happen, right? It can happen to the founders themselves, right? so so this again comes up in founder vesting which i'll talk about please make a note of that i'll cover that later but uh so so the the idea of the shares is dangerous for the reason that people can walk away and still hold the full piece of the company they have even though the promise on which they got the shares they're not fulfilling not the promise not the right word the sort of gentleman's agreement you had about that person is going to do x or y it's irrelevant to the to the to the legal corporate profession basically okay so that's important now so forget the founders just think about new people joining okay you you're doing well and you say i really need to scale i'm going to bring in a vice president of sales okay and i want that person to come in i found this person big company i have the right experience that person is going to quit their job you're going to give them a certain amount of salary and you ob obviously have to give them some equity which is a portion of the company you can you have the now the choice of giving them shares right you can say well you know i have 10 you know my company is 10000 shares and you know i'm going to give you 1000 shares which is 10% of the company and they join or they take the shares and they don't join or they join and they leave in a week right you, you now we know that they take that shares with them right there's nothing you can do right so how to avoid that to avoid that you give them options you simply say i am not going to give you shares but i'm going to give you an option to buy 1000 shares one year from now okay so that's fine so what it means is that 364 days 
they own nothing of the company. 365th day, if they write the check to you, then they own 10% of the company, okay? This period that they're waiting is called the vesting period, okay? You can make it one year, you can make it one month, you can make it four years, you can make it whatever you want, okay? Does that make sense? So what you're doing is you're tying them to their promise. They still get it, right? But they have to do X and Y. So now there's a condition to the vesting. And the condition to the vesting says, you will vest it in a year. That promise becomes a real promise only if you're still employed by this company. So on 364th day, they quit on you, they get zero. Okay, that's how you tie them to the promise of employment and you know, all of that. So that's the vesting part of it. And of course, now we know what an exercising option is on 365 day, they write you a check for the 10,000 into the exercise price. And now those options convert into shares and they own it, okay? That's, that's the thing. Now, the vesting period is actually a little bit more uh, complicated for startups. Okay. By the way, established companies also do stock options and equity, uh, you know, all of that stuff, investing everything they'll do. But venture companies, startup companies do something different, uh, something more complicated. So the typical uh, plan, uh, and this will show up in your stock option plans, is that when you bring in a new person, most of the time you want them to not come in for one month. You don't want, not three months, not six months, it's not worth it, right? Even a year is not worth it. So generally, companies have, the venture community startups have agreed on the period of four years. They feel four years is a good level of commitment from any employee, okay? So they say, I will give you these options and it will vest over four years, but not at the end of four years, which is what you would automatically assume. Instead, they have this thing called, a, uh, they first do wait one year. At the end of one year, one fourth of the options vest, okay? Then after that, you have 36 months, right? And three fourths of the stock. Every month after that, one month's options will vest. So what you're saying is, you must give me at least one minimum year to get anything. So that's called a cliff, okay? You have to cross the cliff period. After that, I'm happy if you give me every month, I'll give you a little bit of the vesting every month, okay? So theoretically, you can write these exercise options every time a bit of the options vest. After one year, after two months after one year, after one year after one year, you can keep writing and exercising, okay? So that is a typical, startup uh, vesting process. Four years, one year cliff, and monthly vesting for the other three years. Okay, so that's a reasonable engagement everybody has agreed to, very conventional now. Okay, does it make sense? Um, yes, yes, Gopi. Yes, Gopi. Um, so Dipankar has a question. I'll probably put it right away because it's relevant to what you're discussing now. So he's asking whether it can be based on performance rather than time, right? So the vesting, can it be based on outcomes or the delivery deliverables from the individual rather than a time horizon based vesting schedule? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, it'll be one of those things where a lot, um, courts have held that's not valid necessarily. Uh, but I, I'm not 100% positive of that. I think certainly people would be concerned that they could be cheated out of their shares because somebody decides you're not working well enough and things like that. This is possible. Uh, but I have not seen generally in startup community anything like this. So uh, where you have milestones that you have to achieve before you can invest your stock. It may be possible, but I haven't seen it. Another question that Gopi that I had is like, uh, is there, I mean, uh, more of a 
a logical i mean logistical question is there paperwork to be done uh, whenever the stocks vest or you just do paperwork first up front and then everything else is just by the paperwork that you did, did up front yeah so this is all mostly about employees and there's thing about founders too but about employees so uh at least in the us uh to to make sure that this is all administered correctly uh there's some laws governing them so you have to have a documented employee stock option plan okay and it should say about this vesting and all that other stuff and then every time you give somebody a certain number of options you give them some kind of a letter saying you get this many options and then you give them a blank letter saying when you're ready fill this out for the exercise okay so those three parts you give yeah that's uh, i mean i i may have some examples i'll show you later yeah sure. okay very good yeah yeah so i've covered all of this um i was ahead of the thing but you can see you know all the things i just explained right you can see at end of first year 1/4 is vested and from month month 13 10000 is vested right 10000 shares it, shares is not the right word options vest into shares but yeah all right okay so um all right so how does this work so obviously you guys have heard of cap tables and i know you have a bunch of questions about co-founders we'll get to that um uh, that's a bit more complex uh so cap capitalization table or cap table is the document that explains how the ownership of the company is spread okay so this is the kind of stuff that happens so you can see here that uh you know a founder like first of all you see this thing called uh, authorized shares okay there's 10 million uh, for generally speaking in the united states 10 million is a good number to work with okay so uh we have this thing called authorized and then uh, allocated uh, shares and i'm not sure india has the same thing by the way india may not have that so you can say i may issue 10000 uh, 10 million shares but the actual issued shares can be much lower only like 1.5 okay the reason for that is that if a let's say a venture capital company comes in and you have to give them shares right and they want to buy a big chunk of it then they give if they want to buy another 1.5 million they can just buy give you money and buy those shares and this total uh, authorized shares won't change okay it leaves room for these people it gives a structure to work with so i i i prefer that i just don't know how it works in india so something to be checked but you can see how this is working right founder ceo has x amount of shares okay and out of the total issued shares uh he will have 35 uh uh the math seems wrong here oh this is the oh this is the future people i'm sorry it's all a, sorry uh, i made an error this is all allocated uh everything is allocated all 10 million okay so so i'll i'll explain that so founder ceo has 3.5 million shares and so he gets 35% other founder gets another 35% okay then you start hiring vp of sales cfo vp of marketing etc and you give them these number of options okay uh so so here you see i say four year with one year cliff right but even though it's maybe the first year and they don't they haven't fully vested you've allocated it essentially okay so it'll show up as 100% okay so it'll show up like this so you'll you'll start you you will have to decide how much to give to every role but this is not unusual okay normally uh a a c a, a vp level normally gets given between 1% to 4% okay depending on importance and experience and so on okay uh a manager tends to be given you know this kind of shares or options and employees get these many options so they get uh, less than now this is typically the first set of people right 
if you already have a thousand employees and another employee joins, you're not going to give them 40,000 at that point. You may give them only 5,000, 10 years down the line or something. Okay. So you, all, you allocate all of these and this is how you give it. They all have their own vesting periods. Uh, if you have advisors, uh, you can give them uh, options and they can vest in a slightly different way, like monthly vesting. So this is typical, okay? This is all well and good. This is kind of what happens in the early days. Okay, now I want to point out two different things. One, you notice this thing says allocation of stock for future people. Okay, 1.5. There is no people, right? There's nobody, right? We assume that there are people here, but we are preserving this money, uh, this, uh, these uh, shares, because we expect to keep hiring and we want a pool from which to give them. Okay, that's the employee, it's, it's uh, employee option pool. It's preserved for them. And that's uh, pretty much a requirement here Again, you had to check in India if this is applicable, but this is this, the VCs will insist on it, okay? Do you have allocation for future employees? When we talk about employee stock option plan, typically it really is this pool that is being administered, okay? It's really for people that are coming later. Even though the plan rules are also applicable here, it's this is the options on which the employee stock option plan will affect. And, and what is the employee stock option plan? It's what I already told you, which is anybody coming into the company gets a four year vesting, one year cliff, subsequently monthly vesting, okay? For different roles, we're gonna give a different number of options and they have to work and vest to get the benefit and that's it, okay? That's that's. Uh, about what we are talking about, okay? There's, a, there's one more nuance to it called ISOs and so on. I'm not gonna go to get into it because I think it's different in India, but that's basically, this is the piece that the employee stock option plan will be addressing, okay? So does it make sense so far? Uh, yes, Gopi, yeah, it does. Others, questions? Gopi? I'm not sure if this is going to be covered in the future. So we've allocated 1.5 million funds for the future, right? But what if there's a VC who wants a huge chunk of the, of the organization? Good point. Let's say you, like, uh, you have 10 million shares, okay? And if you went out and tried to get yours evaluated, uh, you would be $5 million worth right now, okay? Which is fantastic. You guys are doing good. And then this VC comes along and says, I think you guys can grow fast if I give you $5 million, okay? If I give you $5 million, you're gonna go really fast, okay? So take my, take my 5 million, you're already 5 million worth. If I give you 5 million, the two of us will own 50-50 portion of the company, right? So then what this it says, well, this much is already allocated, okay? Uh, let's make a simple assumption that all these options are already given out, okay? The pool is exhausted. Every share is either, either a share or option. So the VC comes in, they give 5 million. You would then issue 10 million more shares directly to the VC, okay? You take their 5 million, okay? Now the company's worth becomes 10 million. Okay, let me ch change this number so that it's easier, simpler to understand, okay? Forget this part. Let, uh, the, your, your companies, you have 10 million shares fully issued, okay? You value your company. Your, your company is valued at $3 million, okay? So the VC comes and says, I can grow you faster by giving you more money. I'm going to give you $3 million more. So now your company is already $3 million worth. You get the cash. What's your company's value now? Six million, right? So it's six million worth, but he owns three million of it. The rest of the people own three million of it, right? So the shares is 50-50. So 50% 50 is 10 million. That means you have to issue him a brand new set of 10 million shares. Okay? So that's, that's, that's what happens normally. And that's where the uh, concept of dilution comes up. 
when that happens what is the amount of ownership founder ceo have at that point after the issuance of the extra 10 million shares becomes half ownership. right it cuts half right in this case yeah they, in this case it's diluted their ownership of the company is diluted by new investments okay so you'll hear this word dilution as part of term sheets and so on which is a whole different painful thing but that's what's happening but that's a simple example you may they may not give you 3 million they may give you 1 million they may give you 10 million anything can happen okay so that's all uh, possible but that's how it kind of works Gopi, uh, follow one question from that, right? Uh, and if you, you can park this, if this is a very com I mean, complex scenario to explain, right? Uh, I've also heard uh, where uh, ESOPs, has, I mean, the pool is structured in a non-dilutable way, right? Even if subsequent investments happen, then the employee options don't dilute, whereas the founder options, founder's uh, ownership could dilute. Is, is there something like that or, uh, or everybody dil dilutes? Yeah, I have not heard of it here. It's normally everybody gets diluted. It would be an unusual circumstance for employee options to not get diluted. Employees don't have power, okay? Right. Unless yeah. they're in unions or it's, so nobody represents the employees in this yeah. thing. Nobody cares in a way, right? But you know who gets uh, this kind of dilution protections? Anti-dilution protection is called. You know who has power? They get it. Who has power? The founders and the investors. No, the board, the board of directors. just the investors. Okay, just the, yeah, the investors. investors. Just the new investors who are given cash. The founders don't get anti-dilution protection. Only the new investors. So you you have this. You know, I said like you know, uh, ten million shares, three million value. They gave three million. It's six million. You've been diluted, right? But let's say now you go to Series A. And let's say you're still 6 million and another person comes along and they say, well, I want to give you 6 million. Okay. And, uh, and so now what happens, everybody gets diluted one more time, right? Uh, you know, you, the, the, the founder stock went from 35 to 17.5 and then it's going to cut half again. So it goes to 8.75 or something, right? They are all diluted except the uh, the first investor, as part of their agreement to give you three million, they'll have a clause called anti-dilution provisions. Okay, so they may say, if somebody gives more money, I have the right, right, to invest more money to keep my share at the same level. So that typically means they have to give more money. It's not like you'll still own the same piece typically. Right. Okay, uh, but but that's how it works. Okay, thanks, Kupi. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was like one thing. This employee options is like, that's where the whole stock option, but the stock option plan is really not that different between your first uh, uh, VP and the actual employee coming later. Okay. It's uh, so, Kupi, bear that in mind. Uh, sorry, one more question, Kupi, before you proceed, right? So, how do you, uh, so if, if the, this, the stock option plan that we draft out, right, is that is that something that's set, set in stone that every other employee who's joining subsequently goes through the same thing, right? If that's the case, then how do you give preferential treatment for uh, people who join you, I mean, who are in the race with you much earlier, right? Is it just the, the quantum of options that they get or are cliffs yeah. could be different or the vesting period could be no, different? No, you don't change any of the terms, but you give them more or less options. You don't change the price. You don't change any of that because people can sue you for that. But you can more give them more or less options. Okay. If you really like someone, you can say, "I'm going to give them more." Like that kind of stuff. It's okay. really the quantum. Okay. Sure. Sure. So there's one other thing. If you notice, you know, right now most of you guys, you own your company. You own everything. Okay. But did you notice that founders also have vesting here? How did that happen? You don't own your company if you have vesting, right? You could suddenly not own anything. So think about this, right? This is the worst thing the investors do to you. So you're, you're, you're a founder. You go in and they say, I'm going to give you three million, okay? Let me, this doesn't happen, but this could, you know, it, it's something to think about. They come in and say, okay, I'll give you three million. But you know what? You founder must also 
vest, okay, I'm a, 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 with the same plan as the rest of the employees, okay? And also as part of the investing, I need a board seat, okay? You have a board seat, I need a board seat. And then we're going to jointly find a third board seat, okay? Third person that we agree on, okay? Except the third person, you don't know anybody who can be a board member, they know they tend to be like associated with the venture capital people. So essentially they have two board seats and you have one, okay? They, so, so now what happened, you went from owning 35% to getting diluted to 17.5%, and then you're starting to vest that 17.5%. They get the board seat, the first board meeting, they say, we don't like this founder CEO, we're firing him. What happens to you? You, know, you get voted out. You, you got nothing. You have no shares. You got zero. This is feasible, right? It's unlikely, but it's feasible. Just want you to be aware. It's in the, it's in the well, first of all, they, they're not just buying the company. They're, in a sense, buying the founders, right? They trust the founders. So they don't want to do this. Okay, that's number one. Okay. I'm just giving you like a worst case scenario. Uh, uh, you know, second, almost immediately, any founder in the situation should file a lawsuit. Very likely outcome. And you can only do this one, once or twice before no founder will actually work with that VC, right? So it's not, in real terms, it won't happen. But I want to show you how big a change they make to your life. Because when they come in, they say, you must wear a vest. The, their justification is that you know, it's been going on, I give you money, you decide right after I give you the money, you know, and you're fully vested, you essentially say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm done with this, I'm, I'm taking a couple of years off, I'm gone, right? So they put in the money, you still own a big part of the company, and they don't get what they're expecting, right? So to make sure that you will also work, and commit, and that's why the uh, vesting actually happens. So they will tend to go like it's four years, but you know what? We're going to accelerate vesting one year. You know, we're going to like you know only do three years worth of shares still to be vested. They'll do some adjustments like that. But those are things to negotiate, right? You should come from the point of no, 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 no. I'm like I'm, I've been working on this for five years. I'm not going to you know vest or any of that sort of stuff. You can start from there and then negotiate. So that's, so, so in the you, in number of things you notice, cliffs and other things, uh, the sh amount of shares change by role, the employee stock options we talked about, uh, new employees, the fact that the dilutions happen, the fact that you yourself will have vesting, you understand all of this, right? Any questions here? Uh, Gopi, when, when the sort of so for, on the founder options again, uh, uh, like you said, it's an unlikely scenario. But when 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 you incorporate the company, right, and uh, let's say two directors in India, like private limited, you have two directors uh, incorporating the company. Let's say you and your co-founder do that. So that time, um, you actually get the shares of the company, right? Not options of the company, right? So I I, I didn't understand how the uh, founders. Uh, uh, ownership kind of converts it from a, a share to an option, right? At what point uh, can an investor can come in and say, hey, your, your, so do they come and change your existing ownership and convert that into a vesting schedule? Or it's Yeah, I, my, my, I don't know exactly how it would work in India, but what they, they have the, I think they have the ability, if you only have like 100 shares, which is how a lot of companies are incorporated, at 50-50, they simply say, we're going to authorize a million shares at, one paise par value or something like that. Okay, so your number of shares becomes very diluted. It becomes meaningless. And then out of the remaining, you get this much. Some of it is real shares, some of it is options. Got it, okay, sure. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, uh, so that's, that's really the key thing about- Ruby, this is Santosh uh, here, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. So, um, so, for example, there are about uh, five co-founders to start off, and uh, three of them uh, promise to join at a later point of time, and only two of them, uh, two of the founders, will be uh, you know investing their full time in the 
um, business initially. So after a period of six months or a one year, those three uh, founders who were who had promised that they will be uh, getting into the full time business will not be able to, for cer certain circumstances, be able to join as full time uh, employees for this company. So how do you go about? Uh, you know, is there any hard and fast rule to uh, split the um, uh, you know uh, stocks or the options? Well, that's the scenario I painted earlier. Mm -hmm. If you have agreed to split already and mm -hmm. you allocated them shares and their name is on papers and so on, mm -hmm. uh, you're in trouble because they can hold on to it. Okay. Okay. So uh, can... that's not wise. So what you have to do is to, you have to say, okay, only when you have quit your job or in full time, okay, do mm -hmm. you have this? Or you have to say, you know, uh, we're going to, we're already going to rest. Okay. Even uh, just among us. Mm -hmm. And only mm -hmm. if we stay, so it's, it's a good plan. Even um, forget the VCs. Mm -hmm. If you're three or four or five of you are there, mm -hmm. if you have vesting, the remaining people can control how much is actually given out to people that leave. Right. So okay. try to do options rather than shares if you can uh, accommodate it. Okay. Will that be possible in a LLP or it should only be a private concern? I think my, my thinking is that this, we have what's called a C-Corp. The mm -hmm. private limited is the closest equivalent. I would say this mm -hmm. all works for private limited. And mm -hmm. I would say it probably doesn't work for LLPs and other similar structures. The, to my, to the, my knowledge, there's less than 50%. So I couldn't give you close advice on that. Sure. Got that. Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, so I want to show you a couple of things quickly. Uh, so let me get out of this. Hmm. Okay. Uh. So this is an equity incentive plan. Okay. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. This is the document that governs the employee stock options. Okay. It would look something like this. See stock option grant notice, and there's a number of you know, things like that. So the important key things to notice here is, you know, all the definitions, vesting number of shares, exercise price, method of payment, all of these, these are typical, right? You already kind of get what I'm talking about here. And compliance to laws, various other things, uh, like, you know, like what happens if you're terminated or you're dead or all those kinds of things. So there will be a lot of those kinds of things. There'll also be information about how to exercise it, okay? You know, well, you know, and there's thing called right of first refusal. If you take your stock and you go to a competitor, you, that may not be good for you, right? You may want to say, I, I may want to be, have the company must have the ability to buy it back. So you can do those kinds of things, okay? So this is a good thing to just sort of review to see what kind of things you, you have to deal with, okay? So I, that's one thing. Um, then let's see, let's move in here. Okay, so, um, this is the notice of exercise. This is the blank thing you will give, okay, to a person saying, when you're ready to exercise, you fill this form out and give it to us, okay? How many shares I want to exercise, etc. Make sense? Here's a cash payment, they will sign it and they'll be done, all right? So if you looked at an actual exercise to notice, see, this is Beth, oh no, this is Suresh, so number of shares, I want to exercise it. You know, am I going to pay this much? The total exercise price for these many shares is this much, et cetera. Okay, make sense? So like that. So, so that, that's kind of the paperwork part of it, just to kind of have a feel for it. All right, so, uh, uh, so we have a little bit of time and I know there were some questions. I'm just going to see 
uh, if I can just answer the questions that you guys are already asked, okay? Rather than go through the presentation some more. What are the later challenges we may need to face with ESOP, if any, right? Um, so the, the only thing I can think of is that normally an employee stock option plan goes for a while and then you know it, it may have a termination date then you may need a new stock option plan uh, or you have employees that are fully vested four years right and then you want to still keep them then you have the right to give them more options under the same stock option plan that that could happen okay that's about it i don't know of challenges per se is it a uh, the second question is is it a good idea to invest in a brilliant idea of an employee and make it a business Shares should be given on what ratio is it the idea of the other person, but making it happen, scaling execution is the work of the co-directors. So, so I, I'm, I'm, get, I'm going to understand this as you have an employee, uh, you want to spin off a company with that person, and you're going to give money to get them started off, right? And how to actually, what is the ratio, et cetera. Generally speaking, um, I've said this before in your classes, ideas are not worth that much. Just because somebody has an idea, you shouldn't be giving like shares and so on. What you really should be giving is execution ability, okay? Or, or actual, actual results, right? They've actually made a sale, right? And then you're building the product for the sale. Then you give them. So idea itself, I think, is less valuable than the ability to execute. So I, that's what I would say in that case. Um, ratio, uh, there's a lot of logic. There's some slides in the presentation. I'll see if I can get to it. Okay, I'll, I will get to it um, really quickly. How to do equity splits, some, some rough logic, okay? So when you are considering giving shares or splitting shares, these are the kind of criteria to look at, okay? Whoever, even though it's idea, it's a sweat equity, it's your life, et cetera, bottom line, cash is always worth more than all of that. Okay, you know, because you're dealing with funders and all of that sort of stuff, okay? So if you have two founders and one person is putting in cash, that must be valued more, okay? So that, you know, you'll, you'll see that people are, people will always say, I'll put in time, but they will very, very rarely say, I'll put in money, correct? Okay. Yeah, life. Yeah, life commitment. Like whoever sacrifices other things to do this startup gets more. Okay, as a rule of thumb, right? What is more? You have to figure it out. But you know, if you are quitting your job and you work, and the other person is working part time, you're not equal by any stretch of the imagination at all. Okay, don't even get like. To me, it'll be like. You know, if that happens, it's like 80, 20 or even less, okay? In terms of commitment, taking money, right? If you have two people and one needs a salary, a small amount of salary and the other is not taking any salary, the person that take, takes a salary must get less, okay? Even if their families, you know, needs to pay rent and mortgage and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter, okay? Everybody has problems. And that's how it ought to work. Originator of idea, driver of company. Now, I said earlier that idea itself doesn't matter. It's not just the idea. It's a person that pushes it, that's out there, that's hustling, that's thinking about it 100% of the time, that's going to all the startup meetings, that's talking to all these people. And that driver, that person is key. That's the person that VCs invest in too. So that person should get more. And then like a little bit minor, Time commitment, right? Whoever spends more time gets more key roles. I can't see the bottom of this thing. Yeah, CEO, CTO, VP get, get more than others. Okay, does that help with that question about how to split? Um, yes, Kofi. Okay, good. One other thing is there's a tool called Slicing Pi. Uh, uh, I've never used it, but I've heard good things that it helps you figure out uh, equity between founders. Take a look at it, but, um, but also look at the points I made earlier, okay? Um, 
What is the best ESOP distribution plan? I think I've already covered all of that in some way or other. Members consisting of part-time and full-time workers. Uh, again, up to you, but obviously full-time people matter more and you'll give them more. How ESOPs work, terms, conditions, and contractual requirements. That's a lot of that uh, I can share with you guys as the example. If you want, later on you can ask and I can, I can get you a template. How to decide how much stakes and how to value it. Again, you know, you use these kind of criteria, okay? Instead of just kind of, oh, I don't know, like, you know, I'm just thinking about more than you, so I should get more. You actually kind of measure these things as best as you can and then divvy it up, okay? Uh, how to plan ESA for a startup, how to effectively use so it's the right talent. I think you heard about this already uh, through the thing. So those are the questions you have. What other questions do you guys have that I, I can uh, cover? Um, Gopi, one question that we put on the parking lot was uh, the underwater options that you kind of said you will talk about later. So that's the thing. Apart yeah. From that, we'll the question on the yeah. Chat. Yeah. So good, good question. So let's say um, I, yeah, I use the example of it's 2000 rupees per share, right? And you have, you have like one year later, it's vast. You're ready to buy. You see that the sh shares are worth 2100 then you should buy it because you can turn around and sell it immediately and make 100, 100 rupees per share. That makes total sense, right? But what if the shares at that point are 1900 rupees? What do you do then? Would you spend 2000 to buy the 1900 rupees shares? No, right? You lose money immediately. So that point when your exercise price, right, is above the current par value, right, then it's called your options are underwater. Right, right. Okay, that's what it means. So that's typically a problem. Uh, a lot of times, the exercise doesn't have to be immediately after the year is over, you have a period of time, like a year or two years or whatever to exercise, you can just wait until it's above water and then exercise, right? So, but if your options are underwater, people are not, not gonna be happy, right? They're, they're, all their investment is worth nothing. And new employees, when you hire them and they, they figure out that options are underwater, they won't join you. Because that to them says that this company's value is going down, not going up. Right. Makes sense? Okay, so that's the thing. Other things, other questions? Uh, Gopi, uh, maybe an, uh, a scenario there, right? So let's say the employee decides to leave, even though they had uh, options that have been vested, right? But they decide to leave because, uh, I mean, you might have, you might send them or uh, the situation is so bad that you, you are, they are leaving, right? So uh, the vested options, they could they still exercise after they quit? Is there a clause to, for, for them to exercise their options even after they leave the company? I'm, the, I'm talking about the vested shares, not the unvested part of the... Yeah, the vested shares, at that point, once it's vested, they own the promise. So they don't have to be in the company anymore. Okay, okay, sure. Hey, uh, again, uh, if anyone else, uh, JP, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and ask the question, JP, rather than chatting, now that you've come to, uh, towards the end. Yeah. So, um, Gopi, a uh, hypothetical uh, uh, question. So, for uh, for instance, like uh, if the company don't have enough cash uh, to pay for the employee who have wasted uh, their time and want to exercise uh, uh, the uh, 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 the options, uh, in that case, like uh, how do we handle it? The company doesn't have cash or the employee doesn't have cash? The company doesn't have cash. To pay brand new employees? Uh, not to the brand new employee. The, uh, uh, the person who have vested and uh, uh, is what okay. exercise. So you, the company doesn't need any cash. The company is taking the money from the employee, right? You have an option, with, uh, which is a promise, to sell that person shares at a particular price which means you give them shares, they give you money. So hmm. the company doesn't have to spend any money at all. The employee has to spend the money at that time. A small amount of money, but they spend the money. It's not your problem. You don't have to spend any money at the time of exercise. Okay. 
which does remind me of another thing. It's not just employees. Let's say you're getting real estate, right? Mm. And you don't have money to pay. You can tell them, listen, about you know, 10,000 rupees of rent, like at current valuation, it works out to about you know, 1,000 shares. You know, can I give you an option for a year? And you give me the rental, right? And, uh, and, and in India, that'll be very hard to do because the culture doesn't know about these things. But in the US, when we have really got crazy, like my, my laundry person asked me, do you guys have options to give us? So <laughs> seriously, it's like, oh my God. Um, so yeah, so that's a feasible, that'll happen in India too at some point. Yeah. It's just not there yet. Uh, Gopi, I mean, uh, a side question on that, right? So would, would uh, like uh, options to advisors, options to uh, consultants uh, who are doing set, sweat equity and all that, and even the laundry person, would it come under the employee stock option plan or do you have to craft a separate uh, option plan for, uh, for such um, kind of employees? Yeah, I, I don't think, I mean, I think you need some kind of a structure. And I think the reason why employee stock option plan is like a legal structure is because governments try to protect employees, right? So they want to make sure that companies are not screwing people over. So they have a lot of requirements you have to meet. I believe that's where that comes from, which is why it's a formal document. Uh, but I think, it, I think the other people don't have to be like advisors and so on, because we do kind of issue options before even the stock option is there for a VP of sales, for example, right? Right, right, right. So, so it's feasible to give without the actual plan. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Gopi, one more question. Uh, yeah. What happens like if uh, the company don't have the ESOP uh, initiated at the beginning of, uh, uh, before the investor comes in? and uh, wanted to do this so is, so how do we structure it even at a later point of time is, is there anything I, I don't i mean theoretically you don't have to in my view have to have a esop plan even in the us so it's probably less likely in india because startups are newer there so you can go ahead and do these kinds of vesting and stuff one off like that it's no problem i think okay uh, but when a venture capital firm comes in they want everything proper. They mm -hmm. want, they'll do due diligence. And if you don't have it, they'll want this set up. Again, it's, it's certainly necessary here in the US. I'm not sure if it is necessary in India, even when a venture capital firm is involved because it has to do with the government, right? Most of the time. Mm -hmm. I would expect that if it's a US VC, they will still require it even in India, just to keep things very clean and consistent and clear and not like people just doing whatever they want on the side. Okay, so we can also set it up at a later point of time. So for, for instance, like the, uh, the, the, we have a seed capital and we don't have any structure at this point of time. And a VC comes in and uh, he wants to structure it. So uh, we, we can structure the ease up at that point of time. Absolutely, yeah. All right. Yeah, you can you can wait and do this after the VC comes and so on. That's totally fine. And uh, the the only thing is that now you guys know all the language hmm. and all the sort of problems. Right. When I started my first company, I knew nothing. All of the stuff was dumped on me after <laughs> the funding happened. I had to figure out all this stuff and figure out when you know it's very confusing at that point. But you know the language, you know what could happen, then you're in better position. JP, only one thing, uh, you need to amend your articles of association in such a way that ESOP is included. While at the time of incorporation, if it's not done, okay. on a later date, when you want to implement it, you need to have that uh, amended. Okay. Yeah, that's where you need to talk to Badri and other corporate secretaries and lawyers to figure out what is required, what is not required, when is it required, who are the authorities to inform, what are the documents to file, all that junk. But they'll, that's, I think that's a lot of it is people that know it and you just have to tell them and they'll do all that. These decisions are the hard part. How much to give each role, no corporate secretary can tell you, right? You have to figure that stuff out. 
Yeah, correct. So at the, at the time of vesting, it technically it does not happen anything for an employee side, but for employer, yeah, there are a lot of uh, documents that needs to be filed with Ministry of Corporate Affairs, I mean, ROC, internal board meetings and everything. There you go. Very good. So was this uh, good? Did it kind of really set you guys up with a base of knowledge so you kind of know you can manage this in the future? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Gopi. Absolutely, yes, Gopi. Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah, it was great, yeah. yeah. Gopi, thanks very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Gopi. It was very really good. informative. Very good. So the risk that we ran was a smattering of knowledge, right? Because you could, you could with the half-baked knowledge, you could actually mess up things, right? And so kind of getting the fundamentals correct is, uh, I mean, uh, was, was very essential. Good. Okay, a quick, a, a quick one from me, uh, uh, Gopi. Uh, this is the Pankar. Thanks very much. This uh, income that, uh, uh, is this considered as an income to the company when the employee pays for the share and therefore it is, uh, you know, the company has to pay income tax on that? I don't believe so. No, I don't think it's like capital, right? It's uh, okay. money you put in for shares is capital for the company. So it's not an income. So it's more of an asset. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah you won't pay ta taxes on that. Okay. Um, so, okay, I, I, I want to finish up with one thing. I want you guys to be super careful about this disease. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite dangerous right now. Uh, and, and particularly like we, we today have 600,000 cases, six lakhs. Mm. We started about the same time as India in terms of our first case. And it's going to be really, really bad. But we also in the last uh, uh, three weeks, uh, not including this past week, we had 16 million jobs lost in three weeks. That's about 10% of our total employment. Okay. Wow. So yeah. that means a lot of bankruptcies are coming mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So it's a massive hit to the economy. A demand is, uh, supply has been suffering because of nothing is moving, but demand is going to suffer because people don't have money to buy. Right. So there's, there's going to be a huge hit to the economy and it's going to, my best assessment is that it's going to be a very long uh, bounce back. It's not going to be an immediate one because of all this job losses and so on. So it's going to be quite that bit of time. The good news is that in, within about three months, I expect some kind of a treatment. So that if you get sick, you can be fixed. Okay. And in about a year's time, we should have a vaccine. So once those two things are there, even though the virus will still be here, people will still get sick, uh, I think we will be able to manage. But the, the, the deep hole we are in, it's going to take some time to come out. Okay. Yeah. So, so we all have to kind of take that into account as we plan our life and plan our companies and so on. That's an important thing. I and others are doing a lot of initiatives to try and reduce the impact. I'm involved with companies that are producing ultraviolet uh, air cleaning devices and copper, you know, surfaces and various other things. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, working with Santosh uh, to uh, to discuss like what kind of startups make sense in this environment. This is going to go for at least two years. And, and the, the third piece of news I wanted to mention was that I'm actually uh, a part of, Founder Institute is running a program to create new venture capital firms. They invited me and I'm trying to create a venture capital firm myself and to raise money and invest in companies. And my thesis is, this is an area, disaster mitigation, pandemics, floods, fires, storms, earthquakes. This continuously happens. Climate change is happening. 9-11 happened. Supply chains gets, gets disrupted. We need a set of companies to solve these problems. Right. And we want to help in that area. And part of that is US-based, but offshore costs and low-cost low cost services, full service, kind of like what we tried to do at uh, Chennai. So this is something I'll be working on. So you guys can keep that in mind. If you want to know more, you can reach out to me and I'll share with you the thesis so you can see what the focus is and where we are going and what is possible. I mean, it's, it's, I'm in the position you guys are in, we're in, which is a really hard program that you may not ever graduate out of 
right? So it's, it's new for me, but uh, uh, I'm just sharing with you the path that I'm following. So sure. you guys can keep an eye on that, okay? Sure. All right. Wonderful yeah, gentlemen, that, Gopi, reach yeah. out. Sorry? Good luck with that, uh, Gopi. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so th thanks a lot, Gopi. I think, uh, so again, one of the reasons why this entire ESOP conversation kind of spurred up was to, we were all trying to figure out how to compensate some of our uh, core team members, right, with the options instead of cash, right, because that's, that's one way in which you can conserve cash and sort of, I mean, stretch your runway longer, right? So, so all of this kind of leads back to the same situation that we are all in, uh, in trying to stay, I mean, keep head above water, right? So thanks a lot, Gopi, for your time. Uh, I, I didn't give you much notice, so thank you. And, and you've already, already given me the license to reach out to you for more sessions. So I'll, I'll do an informal poll with the team to, uh, to ask them what, are the, what else would they love to hear from you. Um, sure. And maybe we can have a separate session where you can run us through what you're working on, because then it could spark a lot of ideas in our mind, uh, different initiatives that we could, initiatives or even pivots that we could possibly be doing, right, in, in aligning with some of uh, this global uh, uh, shifts that are happening, right? I would say it's not a change, right? it's a shift, right? And in fact, uh, just to give a sneak peek, right? Uh, we are kind of repositioning ourselves uh, in the post-COVID world, right? Uh, Go floaters, right? How we would reposition ourselves for that uh, remote work, distributed work, flexi work, uh, right? Uh, kind of a situation, right? And, and uh, more freelancers, more independent professionals because they, they've lost their job and they're trying to figure out something else with their career, right? With their life. So, so kind of trying to see what could what could things, how could things change and how should, how, how should we should adapt towards that, right? And I'll, I'll probably share it with you once I have con that concrete in my head later on. Absolutely. I'm glad to go over these things with you guys. As you guys always know, it's, uh, I'm pretty open to kind of share anything that we have and, uh, uh, you know, give you guys, uh, you know, ideas and direction and, and help you guys out as best as I can. So definitely reach out whenever you want. Uh, thanks a lot, Gopi. Uh, uh, any other questions, uh, guys? Uh, just ping me, DM me. Uh, we, I'll consolidate that and send it to uh, Gopi, and then uh, we can have his answers on the uh, on, on WhatsApp. Uh, so with that, thanks a lot, Gopi, once again for your time. I know it's a little later in the night for you, but thanks a lot for staying there and helping us through the situation and also sharing your knowledge. Uh, looking forward to uh, more such sessions with you. All right, sounds great, guys. It's, Enjoy it's, yourselves. It's, it's good to be Stay back safe. in that. It's good to be back in the FI mold where you, we are hearing from you and having a healthy conversation on, on, our, on our I think that social part of it, that sort of sub sense of camaraderie and support is actually important because it's, it's a very lonely track and you want to keep working on that. So it's certainly, right. uh, that, for that reason, I would, I would help you guys. Sure. Thanks, Kofi. Okay. Take care. Have a good day, everyone. Good Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Everyone.